We've been doing a couple stories about some of the personalities at Fox News lately, especially people on The Five and people on the Fox News specialists. We're not doing these stories to pick on them. We're not doing these stories because we don't like them. Just the opposite. I like the people at Fox News. I like Greg Gutfeld. I like Jesse Waters. I like Kimberly Guilfoyle. These are smart, funny, interesting people. But they have a hard time getting their mind around this whole racial violence thing. They have a hard time getting their mind around this whole black-on-white crime, this whole black-on-white hostility thing. They just can't get it. They won't acknowledge it no matter how, 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 how much it's presented to them right in their face. The other day, we did a video about the little old white lady that went into the pool party with a group of 30 to 60 black people asking to turn their music down. They taunted her, they jeered at her, they harassed her, they threatened her. A black person picked her up, threw her to the ground, threw her in the pool, all to the all to the enjoyment and hysterical laughter of all the black people present. People at the five, when they looked at this incredible video, they all pretty much agreed right away that race had nothing to do with it. It was just a coincidence. It was just part of the world's greatest coincidence. The latest example that came at a black college uh, uh, commencement address, the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, she went down there to give a speech at this black college. She stands up. She does the normal, hey, I'm great to be here. Great to be a wildcat. Rah, rah, rah. This is the time when, you know, when the speaker says the name of your nickname of your school that's the time when everybody normally stands up and starts going crazy. And they said, oh, that person knows our school name. Hooray. Well, in this case, the black students, the black graduating students stood up. They started jeering her, calling her names, booing her, using racial epithets against her. I mean, you're going to see how out of control it is. But even during the Fox but, but, but when the five did a discussion on it, did a report on it, the only one who could really acknowledge that the fact that this was a black crowd has something to do with it was Bob Beckel. And Bob's attitude was, well, any white person who goes to these colleges, especially Republican, they deserve it because everybody knows white Republicans are racist and deserving of all the racial scorn they receive at a place like this. So let's take a look at that speech just the reaction to that speech. And let's take a little look at the, the, the five discussion of it because I really want you guys to see these guys, they're not, they're not even trying to get their mind around it. Uh, this, main, this, this black on white hostility that is now mainstream. Then after that, we're going we're gonna to go through a couple of other recent examples of mainstream black on white hostility that is now we find it so often, it is now literally now unremarkable. They want to talk about bravery, the difference between standing alone and predictable groupthink. Roll this, please. Compare Education Secretary Betsy DeVos giving a commencement speech and then the students at Bethune-Cookman University where she was on Wednesday. I am honored to become a wildcat. And it's a real honor and privilege to be with you as we celebrate the Bethune-Cookman University class of 2017. As uh, DeVos it's took the podium at this historic black college, many grads turned their backs on her. Others booed and heckled. Still, she persisted. Not that the left, who throw that phrase around, would care. They enjoy seeing an outsider get clobbered. See how the media reacted. Mediaite, an industry website that vomits predictable assumptions, said that, quote, maybe DeVos should have taken the hint because of an earlier petition that was circulated against her appearance at the school, meaning don't show up. So there's a solution. If people wish to silence you, stay home. Censorship approved by the media. Other reporters on Twitter seem to enjoy the mass bullying, too. So imagine if Betsy wasn't Betsy, but Michelle Obama, a Hillary, a Liz Warren, what would the uh, media industry take then? We know the answer, because we know the media isn't much different than today's students. After all, campuses are where the intolerant left-wing sausage is made. And we just got another glimpse of the assembly line where the casings get filled. 
So this is, uh, I want to do a call for a shot. This is the president. I got to give credit to the college because the college could have canceled and they didn't. They went through it. A lot of people, a lot of people canceled these events or I mean canceled these speakers, but they went through it. This is um, Edison Jackson, who's the president. If this behavior continues, your degrees will be mailed to you. Choose which way you want to go. I thought that was great, Kimberly. I love it. I mean, this is unbelievable, the kind of behavior that you're seeing in colleges. I mean, it's, it's so, imagine if your child went there and behaved that way and was so disrespectful to somebody that had the courage to show up and to be able to speak to them, somebody who strongly supports education and educational choice. It's really sad what's happening, and it's, it's happening very quickly and in rapid succession across this country. And it's not because institutions of education. It's institutions of ignorance that don't even let anybody speak or try to listen or understand a different point of view. Uh, I think she handled herself with composure, and I commend the university for the way they handled it. Yeah, you know, Bob, um, I'm sure that there's students there who disagree with her policies, but isn't it better just to listen, maybe? You might, who knows? Well, yeah, yeah keep in mind a couple of things. I, I've spoken at uh, Bethune-Cookman, and, and it is a historical black college. It needs the federal, federal funding to, mm -hmm. to stay alive, as, as do the other ones. Uh, and the Trump administration and Ms. DeVos, who has never, actually probably never been in a crowd that large of uh, people who are, well, let me just move that aside. I get in trouble for saying that, but I don't think she's because you don't know that, that it's true. Well, well, well I just said to, I think it, I would be a good guess, but, but that's, that, that, that's a but guess. Here, but here's, here's a, the uh, the Trump administration has has said that they would like to do away with federal funding for most universities, and if that were to happen, this school would go under. This woman has attacked over and over the edu public education system, uh, and and particularly in Detroit and in minority areas. These kids came out of those schools and made their way through and are graduating. And this woman has done everything she can with all the millions of dollars she has to undermine public education. Or make and it better. Push, well, no, or make, make it, it better. better. No, no. I, you, you, well, you may think of make it better, but this woman has been attacking. Well, choice and attacking, makes everything and better. Attacking, well, that's... You may believe Everybody's pro-choice. Well, the left wants to born. limit the choices that families no, we, and no, students we don't have. Don't That's what limit, you're saying. We don't want to limit the choices, but we can't. Give, uh, you're not going to be able She's to get to every child choices. into uh, a, 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 a another school. Of, well, so not, that makes it okay? Yes. It's like too bad? What, what then gonna, the break? No, no, no. Because one of the things that Republicans do, you all jump on public education. You know, most people in this country like their public education. I've it's like worked saying, as a it's public like saying, education teacher. Most people like, like their health care, too, right? Well, well, no, but listen, it's like saying, you know, you've made a bad choice doctor. by going to the public school system. And these, these kids, if I were them, I would not have showed up, number one. Uh, that would but have been the a real option. person who's, who's, who's uh, I think, the villain here, whoever invited this right-wing anti-minority school oh, person. Oh. So anti-minority is code for racist. I didn't say that. Well, you said anti-minority means racist well, okay. in my brain. I, I, I'm not educated like you are, Greg, so I'll just leave it at right. that. Jesse, it took guts for her to do that. She probably knew she was, you know, walking into a lion's exactly. den and, and, and went through it. And yeah, I mean, she handled it with a lot of class, and I respect the university administrator who told those kids to pipe down. Yeah. You know, the left and the and these college students like to say they're so tolerant and they're for respecting women and open dialogue, and then they behave like this. It was pretty embarrassing. Um, you know, I disagree with Bob on almost everything you just said. Um, I don't think that Trump wants to take away funding for all of higher education. I haven't really, really? heard that ever. <laughs> haven't heard that one, so, have um, you? let me know when you find out what <laughs> the source God. is on that. I'd be happy, happy to look I'll at that. I'll be happy to bring it tomorrow. Back are you going to show up or you have to... Dana? <laughs> oh, my God. Is Nanny going to let you out tomorrow? <laughs> what is going on? No, I it's very really unbelievable. Uh, oh, my God. I think you need to help me out, right? <laughs> I mean, what? What? <laughs> everything. You, you, you remind me of, never mind, Dana. Um, uh, this is what I would just say quickly is, is about um, the fact that people that uh, decide to go into public service, mm -hmm. they're already making some sort of a sacrifice. I'm not talking monetarily, but I mean from just be, putting yourself out there yeah. and, and advocating for positions that they might disagree with. But I actually think that her going there, that 
the school, been giving her an honorary degree, giving her this moment, right. could have then said, do you mind if we have a cup of coffee afterwards because we really want to talk to you about our position? And they probably would have gotten a lot farther yeah. and they gave, with what they, they wanted. Gave, they gave her an honorary degree. That's right. for a reason. I mean, they, they, I think that the university was trying to do the right thing, and it yeah. just backfired. Yeah. Well, I think it, I think it front fired. Well, good. Maybe. I think it was a good. I think it was right, a good. Right, right, right. It exposed it. Yeah, it I think. Yeah, I don't even. I think I invented a word. It's I'm glad very, that they stood up. School. But it's good that yeah. they stood up. But they gave her an honorary degree, so yeah, clearly they, they know something. They well, they, you don't, Bob. They, they must know something. something. There's nobody who gives a commencement speech doesn't get an honorary degree. Well, they're very op they're very open minded there. Yeah. I mean, Bob. I've never, Bob, Bob went there. Bob, did they, did they give you an honorary degree? No. <laughs> I've given commencement speeches 12 times. I'm the only one who never got an honorary degree. Yeah. I wonder why. And what about this clown? This professor at Texan, Texas A&M University giving us a primer on how and when it is okay to kill white people. And no. If I didn't hear it on video and audio, I would not believe it either. Now it's time for my good friend, Dr. Tommy Curry. Every Thursday, talking tough with Dr. Tommy Curry of Texas A&M. Dr. Tommy Curry, how are you, sir? Not bad, sir. How are you doing today? Great. So today I want to talk about uh, killing white people in context. Let's do it. All right, so over the last 20 years, uh, black people have allowed white academics, white liberals, and I don't know if you saw the recent movie, uh, Django and Chang, the actual history of black civil rights struggle and black slave insurrections. Uh, what we have today is a situation where the symbols of King and peaceful white progressives have become the hallmarks of the black civil rights struggle. I mean, we saw this with people like Skip Gates when Obama won the election saying that even all of our slave foreparents who were enslaved and stolen from Africa, all of the suffering, dying, and deaths that we had during the Civil Rights Movement have all accumulated in Obama himself, right? And what that does is it puts a public relations face on the history of enslavement. It puts a popular face on the suffering of African descended people, and it puts a uh, a smile, a a a persona from black people that we can, in fact, talk about American racism without mentioning the threat of violence or social revolution at all. Now, two weeks ago, Jamie Foxx made a joke about how great it was for him to be able to kill all the white people in his new movie. And I saw it, and he's right. Practically every white person in that movie uh, dies a very violent and well-deserved death uh, for their participation in the enslavement of African descended people. But the problem I have with that statement and it used in the context of Django is that it's a fantasy where the death of white people are really just an entertaining spectacle. It's something that didn't really happen. It's not like black people had that type of opportunity under enslavement. And today what you see is a backlash from white conservatives on one hand who are offended, saying that Jamie Foxx is racist, and white liberals on the other hand who are saying that, well, this is not productive if you ever talk about killing white people, and putting the burden back on black people who have actually suffered these type of horrors, saying that you can never have a political conversation about the killing of white people, because that in itself is evil, is nonproductive, is nationalistic. Only evil black nationalists do that, right? And I think that a lot of times black people buy into this as well. Like what I'm surprised about is that I've seen no black public intellectual come out and actually address the issue of violence or social revolution or self radical self-defense by black people historically. So right now, black people simply buy into the idea that, oh, it's entertainment or, oh, you know, violence against white people is only the ideas of the Black, of, of the black Panthers. But in reality, we've had people from Nat Turner to Robert F. Williams, who was the father of the radical self-defense movement that inspired Black Panthers, and he wrote the book Nero with Guns, that thought, of, thought about killing white people as self-defense. Now, remember that these black people were actually in a world very much like ours today, where white vigilantism against black people, murder, state violence, were all deemed normal. This was how you preserved American democracy. This is what Ida B. Wells talks about. You lynch black people because they're an economic threat to white, poor whites getting businesses. You lynch black people to show black people that they can never be equal, so they will never challenge you. They will never pursue politics. They will never pursue the right to vote. So when we have this conversation about violence or killing white people, it has to be looked at in this kind of this historical turn. And the fact that we've had no one address like how relevant and how solidified this kind of tradition is for black people saying, look, in order to be equal, in order to be liberated, some white people may have to die. I've just been immensely disappointed because what we look at week after week is the national catastrophe after catastrophe where black people, black children are still dying. And we are front row, we're front and center when it comes to white people talking about their justification 
foundation for owning assault weapons and owning guns to protect themselves from evil black people and evil immigrants. But then when we turn the conversation back and says, does the black community have a need to own guns? Does the black community have a need to protect itself? Does the black individual have a need to protect itself from police officers? We don't have that conversation at all. Now, we see white citizens arming themselves with assault weapons, fearing gun legislation, and we saw the nationalist rhetoric during the election where people were trying to kill Obama, but we don't have any kind of connection between the arguments made today about the Second Amendment, where people say they have the right to bear arms, and the historical role of the Second Amendment, where it was used to arm white people to, uh, to put down slave revolts and revolts from indigenous natives. So Robert Control and Ra Raymond Diamond write this excellent piece called The Second Amendment Towards an Afro-American's Reconsideration, where they actually trace the history of that and say that the Second Amendment isn't about individuals simply trying to protect themselves. It's actually about community. But the problem is the black community has not taken the time, has not taken the, doesn't have the discipline to look at black politics as an outgrowth of how it needs to protect itself from violent anti-black forces that are still killing our children, that are still attacking our communities, and now is trying to justify nationalist rhetoric to, to preserve its right to bear arms. Dr. Tommy Curry, how can folks get in contact with you? You know, this black and white hostility takes a lot of different forms. Up in Seattle, the mayor of Seattle, he's down with the cause. He's a white guy, but he knows that white people are racist and black people are relentless victims of relentless white racism all the time, everywhere. That explains everything. And that's why, to fix that, he's going to levy a diet soda tax to tackle white privilege, fight white privilege, and institutionalized racism. I think he actually said something that wasn't true also. He said white, rich white people drink more soda. So that's why they're going to tax it so they can, I don't know, it doesn't really make sense. But in point of fact, I think, I think Coke and Pepsi they sell a lot more Coke and Pepsi in the ghetto than they do out in the suburbs. Another example of black on white hostility that is just, I mean, it's, just, it's so amazing. People can't even get their mind around it is the black students at Harvard are going to hold their own commencement. Now, this isn't, you know, this isn't like this isn't like a meeting of the, you know, Black Chamber of Commerce or anything. No. These students that are organizing this separate commencement, they are down with the cause. They're all about white racism. They're all about relentless black uh black victimization all the time everywhere that explains everything. You know, when you go to a black college, Here's another thing the five really couldn't figure out. Even Bob Beckel couldn't figure out. When you go to a black college, you're you're getting a you're going to study racial resentment for four years, day in day out. You're going to learn that the only reason you're at a black college is because white racism is keeping you out of Harvard, Princeton, Yale, you name it. So you're down there. It's all about white racism. That's what your courses are about. What do you think people are studying in their political science courses? What do you think they're studying in sociology? My favorite, and so most of the commencement speeches don't go the way Betsy DeVos's speech went, which started out to be kind of a friendly, hey, you know, hail, hail, the gang's all here kind of thing. Most of the commencement speeches at black colleges are really just congratulating the students for doing so well in their lessons for the last four, five, six, seven, whatever the number of years is, where you've done nothing but learn about white racism and black victimization. Do you guys remember this speech? They will make assumptions about who they think you are based on their limited notion of the world. And my husband and I know how frustrating that experience can be. We have both felt the sting of those daily slights throughout our entire lives. The folks who crossed the street in fear of their safety, the clerks who kept a close eye on us in all those department stores, the people at formal events who assumed we were the help, and those who have questioned our intelligence, our honesty, even our love of this country. And I know that these little indignities are obviously nothing compared to what folks across the country are dealing with every single day. Those nagging worries that you're going to get stopped or pulled over for absolutely no reason. The fear that your job application will be overlooked because of the way your name sounds. 
the agony of sending your kids to schools that may no longer be separate, but are far from equal. The realization that no matter how far you rise in life, how hard you work to be a good person, a good parent, a good citizen, for some folks, it will never be enough. And all of that is gonna be a heavy burden to carry. It can feel isolating. It can make you feel like your life somehow doesn't matter. That you're like the invisible man that Tuskegee grad Ralph Ellison wrote about all those years ago. And as we've seen over the past few years, those feelings are real. They're rooted in decades of structural challenges that have made too many folks feel frustrated and invisible. And those feelings are playing out in communities like Baltimore and Ferguson and so many others across this country. And I'd like to begin today by reflecting on that history. Starting back at the time when the Army chose Tuskegee as the site of its airfield and flight school for black pilots. Back then, black soldiers faced all kinds of obstacles. There were the so-called scientific studies that said that black men's brains were smaller than white men's. Official Army reports stated that black soldiers were childlike, shiftless, unmoral and untruthful, and as one quote stated, if fed, loyal and compliant. So while the airmen selected for this program were actually highly educated, many already had college degrees and pilot licenses, they were presumed to be inferior. During training, they were often assigned to menial tasks like housekeeping or landscaping. Many suffered verbal abuse at the hands of their instructors. When they ventured off base, the white sheriff here in town called them boy and ticketed them for the most minor offenses. And when they finally deployed overseas, white sol soldiers often wouldn't even return their salutes. Now just think about what that must have been like for those young men. Here they were trained to operate some of the most complicated high-tech machines of their day flying at hundreds of miles an hour with the tips of their wings just six inches apart. Yet when they hit the ground, folks treated them like they were nobody, as if their very existence meant nothing. When I first started out this video, I was going to use these recent examples of black hostility towards white people as, um, uh, uh, and I was going to mix them in with other really nasty bits of business, recent black mob violence, black on white crime, black, mur black on white murder, things like that. I'm going to, you save them for the next video. But in this case, we have so, you know, so much stuff here. I didn't really want to, you know, I didn't want to take anything away from that because all these videos and, and all these news stories, and there's lots more, lots more recent ones, they're all kind of, you know, in your face examples of how people like well-meaning, good, smart people like the people on The Five and other people at Fox News, I mean, they just can't get their mind around this. I mean, okay, just another one just came to mind. Do you remember, um, what's his name, Greg Kilmeade? He did a story on Killer Mike once on the Megyn Kelly show last summer. And Killer Mike's known for the song, When You Niggas Going to Unite and Kill the Police, Motherfucker. When you niggas gonna unite and kill the police, motherfucker. Brian Kilmeade does a story saying, oh yeah, Killer Mike's actually a very nice guy. And, you know, he started giving some lame, complicated explanation as to what the song was really about. It was really about something other than, when are you niggas going to unite and kill the police motherfucker? Oh, by the way, you know what happened to Killer Mike after that show. Soon after that show, soon after that video came out, Killer Mike started introducing Bernie Sanders at rallies all across the country. Now, there's a book out now called Shattered, where they talk about how Hillary and Bernie, they ignored white people. They didn't have a message for the white working class, which could not be further from the truth. They had a message they delivered every day, several times a day at all the debates. They couldn't stop talking about it 20, 30% of the time, easy. 
The message is that white people are, are demons. They were demonizing white people on the election trail all the time, just the same way all of these stories involve demonizing white people in the most despicable, in the most deplorable fashion. At some point, at some point, I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow, the next day, the day after, or 10 years from now, these guys on The Five, these guys at Fox, these guys at the next conservative network after Fox are going to have to look this black-on-white hostility in the eye, call it for what it is, and call BS on it. Even if it does make a few black kids angry.